I'm going to hand it over to uh, Wesley now. I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing and seeing his presentation tonight. Um, he's going to take us on a journey and uh, you can take it away, please, Wesley. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you so much, uh, Regina, for handing that over to me. I'm going to do a little screen share here. Jump over to my presentation. Hello. Here. Oh, sorry there for a second. Got to do this uh, advanced portion of the screen. That's what I wanted. Oh. Not sure if that's working. No. It doesn't seem quite right. Guess I'm not doing it quite right. All right, I'll just go the good old fashioned way with just a basic desktop screen share. Here we go. And I'll back out of this, play from the start. Fantastic. All right, here we are. Uh, my name is Wesley Terrence Brown, but you can call me Wes. Um, this talk kind of has uh, two thoughts as I was putting it together. It's a way for me to talk through how I came to what I'm doing, uh, the way that I think about work, the things in my life that have influenced my work, um, helped flow <laughs> and move it uh, from some functional places to some non-functional places, back, forth, um, the experiences and how I've used those to fuel into my work, which is why it's called Life Into Work. Um, and then it's also a talk, hopefully, uh, if you're in a hard place, um, if you're uncomfortable in the studio, if you're feeling stagnant, hopefully this is a talk that can give you some affirmation uh, and help you know that it's worth it if you keep working through. Um, so yeah, without further ado, let's, let's talk about ceramics. Um, I got started in ceramics in high school um, it was something that came up when I think I could take an art elective kind of later in the, in my high school career. Um, what happened was, uh, is I took a class and my teacher, we had all of the necessaries to get everything started. And my teacher gave us a couple of projects, but beyond that, she didn't have a, a very huge depth of knowledge of technique and all the necessary. So it was kind of up to me to figure out how I was going to do it. And so it was this really big challenge to try and go through it and learn as I went. So I, I got to be my own teacher and that challenge really attracted me to the medium of clay. Um, and it attracted me to making pots. Uh, I finished uh, my time uh, in high school and realized that I didn't necessarily have a good idea of what that meant to be an artist. What did it mean to make work? Um, and so I went to get some more education to better equip myself. And so I went to Sinclair Community College. Uh, from Sinclair, I, I worked here and I worked in making pots. Um, I trained under a potter named George Hagman, who was based in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, but was teaching at Sinclair as a professor. Um, I soaked up as much information. I spent as much time in the studio as I possibly could. Um, if you look in that back left corner, all those wheels, those are uh, good old Randalls, good old Randall kick wheels. So I, I did electric wheel in high school for about a year and a half or so. And then when I got to Sinclair, it was all kick wheel. Um, and that was how I got my pacing, my rhythm, my cadence down. Uh, it was, uh, I guess, a blessing in disguise. Everyone wanted the electric wheels, but they were never seemingly open. There was only so many. And so I learned on a kick wheel, which was very, very helpful. Um, from there, I mean, I pretty much I made pots. That's what I knew. That's what I understood. That's what there was. It was a way to have 
a very easy benchmark and understanding of what a successful pot is from an unsuccessful pot. Um, thinking about proportions and function, utility, glaze. Um, that's what I knew. That's what I did. That's what I practiced. That's what I was challenged by. That's where I tried to figure out all the ways to maneuver within the framework of pots. Uh, and I still love pots. <laughs> um, and I finished my time at Sinclair and realized that I still didn't fully have an understanding of what it meant to be an artist. Uh, didn't have a crazy uncle who was making art or a crazy aunt or a cousin or a grandparent who knew anything about the field. So again, I moved to get more education. Um, I applied and got into um, Bowling Green State University and went from a small little studio to a much bigger studio, as you can see. This one, um, I can't even tell you the square footage change. And going from a community college where I was living at home, working a job, and a full-time student, and doing all three of those things, and that was almost all that I did was be home, go to class, go to work, be home, go to class, go to work, be home. So when I switched and made the move to Bowling Green State University for undergrad, suddenly I had this huge freedom. My parents allowed me um, to live on campus. And so for a, at least a year or maybe even two, um, I was a full-time student. I lived on campus, I had meal plan, and suddenly I had 24 access to a studio. And so I went nuts. <laughs> I made work. I lived there as much as I could. And there was so much to see. Um, they had a very impressive, still have a very impressive boneyard of just every artist that's pretty much ever came and done a demo would leave a piece and you could see that work. And I was always captivated by it. How was this made? How was this thrown? How was this texture? It was a completely uh different <laughs> or more expansive vocabulary of pots and sculpture intermingled and it was transformative and it gave me so much more to work with so i kept making pots um i made all of these as you can tell i didn't have a style um I didn't have a particular way of going about it. I mean, I've got everything in there from sgraffito, uh, slip trailing, wax work, spray gun, dipping, porcelain, stoneware, um, celadons to red glaze, and all of that was cone tent. So I mean, clearly did not have a definitive voice, didn't know what I was trying to say, but I, I was definitely speaking, if not fluently, I was speaking a lot. <laughs> but I hadn't found my voice yet. And that was something that I was always working towards was, or was at first confronted with the idea of saying something through what I was making. Um, and uh, I think I went to my first Ensika at this time, uh, which was uh, Ensika Houston, 2013. Uh, which was a really, it, it blew my mind. I was actually walking among the ceramics community for the first time that it was actually given flesh and I was among it. And uh, two of the speakers um, on the sculptural side, I think it was uh, Walter McConnell and Garrett Grimm. Uh, for the potters, it was Kristen Kiefer and Bede Clark. And I watched them both and something about Bede, the way that he handled clay, he was rough. Um, there was a moment I'll never forget where Kristen and Bede were both working and Kristen was talking about uh, keeping her studio clean and air quality and particles and trying not to, to keep the silica down. And Bede looked over, he was on the wheel and he just took his hands and he just slapped his jeans twice and this puff 
of just dried ceramic dust just went into the air. And it was just, it was two completely different ways. Uh, one definitely safer than the other, but it was something that I'd, I'd never seen before. Um, and the way that he interrogated what he was doing, I couldn't tell what he was looking for, but he always seemed to be looking at his pots in this fierce way that told me he was looking for something. And I always found that like so captivating. I couldn't understand it, but I appreciated it. Um, and I was working with people who were interrogating. I was working with um, Clay Leonard and Zimra Biner. They were my two instructors at Bowling Green. Uh, there was a point where I came back after that and I was making pots and I was getting very, very excited because I was getting very, very good. Because um, in making pots, my goal was to be a production potter everything exactly the same, everything, uh, form, proportions, the same. And I made a series of uh, bottles and I remember Clay came over and I was super excited and I was just like, look, I made these bottles and they're all the same and like, aren't you so proud? Like, Tell me I'm good at this. Cause like, this is pretty good. Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna toot my own horn, this is a, this is a very good example of what I am capable of doing. And Clay walked over and he looked at it and he looked at me and he just said, um, those are nice. You're not making those anymore. And I was like, this is not the praise that I wanted. This is um, confusing. And he was just like, these are too easy. You're not making pots anymore. And uh, I think we might've had like a little back and forth um, but I was, I was told I was not allowed to make pots. Um, and this is kind of where Zimmer came in because he said, don't make pots. So I was like, okay, well, I'm still going to use the wheel because I love the challenge of the wheel. And so I started making sculpture as best I could. And so I made this piece, which is, um, soda fired. It's thrown in about six or so sections. It's about four feet tall. It's way heavier than was necessary. <laughs> um, and I remember pulling that out. I was looking at uh, Peter Volkos and Don Wright, particularly his tea stacks. You should look them up if you're interested. And I remember Zimra coming to me and he was just like, it's still a pot. You're not, you're not actually changing once. It's still a pot. And, and granted, at this point, I'm incredibly uncomfortable. I have very little reference as to what makes a good sculpture versus a bad sculpture. And so he came in and he was like, it sits like a pot. It can't, it meets the table in the same way. You have to stop that. And so I was like, okay, you want, you want change? I'll give you change. And so I made a piece that met the table in a way that was completely different. Put a bunch of bulbs on the bottom and uh, still had no idea what I was talking about or what I was doing. Didn't say a message. It was just, technique <laughs> and Zimro I think he was pretty uh he was pretty excited about that it I won't say that it necessarily led anywhere but it showed me that I could think differently that I did have a vocabulary that could be changed that the way that I organized words and form could be altered dramatically it showed me that I could stretch and I think that's, that's the thing that I have to thank Clay and Zimmer for was showing me that I could be challenged and I could stretch myself with help. Um, and so I think I, I went on from there. I, I still didn't have an idea, but I knew I wanted to go bigger. I wanted to go bigger. I wanted to make larger work. So I, I started playing with the idea of uh, doorways and going places and passages and hallways. Granted, intellectually wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> but the idea that I was making work that had the illusion that it was going somewhere made me feel like, yeah, I'm not clueless. Um, and it was at this time that I got to see more artists demoing. Uh, we had a clay symposium at Bowling Green. This year we had uh, Dell 
and Daniel, um, and you couldn't have been two individuals who were more different. You had Dell, who is a, who's a scientist, uh, had a, I want to say a biology or a science degree, uh, undergrad, and then went back for grad school to get an MFA. Um, and then you had Daniel, who went the more old world way, which was more tradition-based um, apprenticeship to get his, his chops uh, and get into this. And well, granted, he was a studio or a production potter. Then he went into an apprenticeship. And they both looked at the work that I was making. And Dell was very kind. And I think he was just like, this isn't really working. And Daniel looked at it and he was just like, um, I don't know what you're saying, but your technique is bad. And it hurt. It hurt to hear. But it was necessary for me to hear it because it was absolutely true. Uh, and instead of just being critical, he offered some construction, which was, hey, I'm working in Michigan. Come up to Michigan and I'll show you how I make my large jars. And so that's what I did. I, I went to Michigan and for about seven and a half hours, one on one, he showed me how to make one of his jars. And it was, it was so, so generous of him to have spent that time with me. Um, we became friends and we ended up uh, starting a little bit of a relationship, which was really cool, which actually led to some more things, which I'll show you. And I think I went back. It was spring break and I made just about one every day, almost, almost one every day. And I ended up firing these in the wood kiln, which was something that I was getting into and was very excited about, but it still didn't necessarily have anything to say. They were technically beautiful, but the concept wasn't really there. The elements that I was borrowing from, thinking about large North Carolinian jars, but also my lids were based in imagery that I was pulling from the Far East. Um, and it just, it wasn't entirely me. So I thought, well, you know, hey, I'm black. Let me do something urban. And so I tried to make some large jars with some graffiti-esque imagery on them. But this was probably even more insincere because I'm from the suburbs. I'm not from that culture. <laughs> I'm not from street culture. I don't do graffiti. Uh, I'm not from North Carolina. And so I found myself in this place where I had all these tools and all of this vocabulary and all of these skills, but I didn't have a way to actually say anything. I didn't know what my voice was. And if we remember this was at the time of 2014, which if we remember was a time of incredible racial unrest. Um, this was the time when um, Eric Garner and Michael Brown, the riots in Ferguson, all took place and I found myself for the first time acknowledging my race in a way that I hadn't before and I have a friend to to really thank who challenged me again in the ways that I talked in the ways that I was thinking um and she downright looked at me at one time and was like you're racist and I was just like no I'm not I'm not racist and she was just like yes you say this, you say this, you think this. You don't like people that are like you. And I, when I finally stepped back, I realized, yeah, I spent my entire life in white spaces. Um, from the church that I grew up in, to my high school, to my friends groups, even to community college, I been pretty much the only black person <laughs> um, outside of family functions. And with that, I'd, I'd gotten a warped view of myself. And so I had to interrogate what that meant. And it just so happened that as all of this unrest was happening, as my relationship with a friend came to a head and, and, re and her saying the words, you're racist, I got the opportunity to travel which for anybody is helpful, 
but for me was again absolutely pivotal in my understanding of myself um i applied and got into the uh, west virginia ceramics in china and i was in i was in shanghai <laughs> Uh, within, I want to say, two weeks of the end of the semester, I was in Shanghai. Um, we went from Shanghai to Jing de Zhen. I got to see work in actual China. <laughs> it was amazing. It was new experience to new experience to new town to new town to new market to new building to new street in a place that was completely foreign. And I was only American which was something that I'd, I'd never been before. There was no hyphen. There was no um, additive to it. I was simply American. And I came back from that experience. I got to make a little bit of work in Jing de Zhen. Uh, then we continued our, our tour around the country uh, to Xi'an and then eventually to Beijing, flew back to the States. Um, was with my parents for not even a full seven days, and I was off uh, for a tour of North Carolina uh, set up by Daniel Johnston. I, I went and worked for a brief time at East Fork Pottery um, with uh, Alex Matisse and John Viglin. I worked there for about two weeks, um, small out in, the, out in the hills to make a little bit of work they showed me how i got to see what it was like the life of a potter um went from there i think i maybe took a week off visited a family friend and then was at daniel johnston pottery for the remainder of the summer which i want to say was probably about a month at that point and i went from being an american in a foreign country to being a black man in the south and it was a lot to take in and at the time i was educating myself i was learning black history for the first time i was reading books like uncle tom's cabin um, michelle alexander's um the new jim crow uh the souls of black folk by w.e.b du bois all at the same time so I, while i was working as a potter the afternoons were spent in conversation about pots and form and place and then in my private time i got to think even more about these things um i came back to the studio with this newfound excitement about myself and also sadness at the history that i had not known and when I got back to the studio, there was no way that I wasn't going to make work about it. The ways that I was thinking, there was no way that I could avoid the topic. And so that's what my thesis year's work was about. It was about race. And so I thought about, uh, um, I thought about the Romans, I thought about the beginning of Western civilization, I thought about water jars, I thought about um, storage vessels and the place of African Americans in a Western society. And so I made pieces like this, which was um, whites kill whites, blacks kill blacks, the bottom line is, which was a direct quote or partial quote from the uh, Bill O'Reilly show, uh, where he was in an interview with uh, Tavish Smiley. And I made that work. I made a work for Eric Garner, um, Black Faces and Gold on one side, and I Can't Breathe for the 11 times he spoke it out. And I thought about my own personal position within particularly fine arts. I, I would go to the Toledo Museum of Art and take images and images and images, which I decided not to include of just plinths of stands, pedestals. And I thought about the position again of the African-American within the art world. 
and what was my place? And I made a piece, uh, this one was uh, an iron casting and it's titled, I Stand Your Ground. Um, thinking a little bit about Trayvon Martin and what does it mean to stand somewhere that necessarily wasn't designed for you or wasn't designed with you in mind or wasn't designed with you as a symbol of fitting within what is perfection or ideal. And I, I finished that work and I remember I was, I was sad down to the bottom of my soul and I was angry. <laughs> to the bottom of my soul. And I remember I was angry for a year. It was a, I, I went to bed at night thinking about systemic racism and I'd wake up in the morning thinking about lynching. And it was like that for about a year. And um, somewhere in there, I, I found a way to make peace with it. Understanding that my anger was not something that I could live with any longer. And so I stepped away from the anger and I didn't numb myself, but I understood that I also had to live. And I finished my thesis show. I showed this work. I was excited about it. Um, I felt passionately about it and I applied to grad school and when I got to grad school, I, I got a new space, which was granted. All of this was mine. It was no one else's and I could claim it. And I thought I'm going to make work about race. It's the work that got me here. It's the work that I think they think I make. So let's go for it. And I think I spent probably the first five or so weeks of grad school completely paralyzed because it was no longer necessary for me to make that work. I wasn't, at a, I wasn't in a position where I could. I, I hadn't been thinking about it, meditating on it, studying it, learning it, examining it, challenging it within my own thoughts and mind. And so I remember meeting with um, my new professors. I can't remember if it was Tim Mather or Malcolm Smith, uh, but one of them simply said, make something make anything you are free to make whatever you want and so i made a couple of really funky things that were these weird exaggerations of pots and once i worked through that weird phase um i started making teapots and i started thinking well what's the uh what's the way that i can make a teapot with jazz you know with some funk some movement to it um stacking it and necessarily getting away from the wheel hand building you know for the first time i was going to hand build instead of throw on the wheel and build up some texture and i was working uh, this is not a black and white i was working with a clay body that was that turned black and i thought about well, what if i made it a silhouette you know what if i was able to make the piece in such a way that when you saw it from afar, it was simply a, a black outline. And then as you got closer, you, you read all the details. And, and as I was making this work, um, I think I had a critique that was pivotal, which was my second critique in grad school. And I wasn't sincere with myself about what I was doing. I spent about a year, maybe nine months or so studying teapots. Uh, their forms, their functions, their proportions. Uh, I presented work that was out of that research and I was for some reason not willing to call them teapots, which in a grad school critique got me raked over the coals. And I came out of that and I was just like, I've lost it. I've lost the plot of land. I don't know what I'm doing. I need to go back. I need to go back and see the life of a potter. What does it mean to live with pots? And so I sent out emails. It was the end of my first year of grad school. I sent out as many emails as I could to as many potters as I knew 
or rather didn't know but knew of and, and could get an email address and uh, eventually one of them answered back uh, and that was Mark Gertson in uh, little Goshen Nana and I actually have one of his uh, one of his mugs uh, which I know not the uh, highest of quality camera here but it's a fairly simple mug ash glaze and I worked with him uh, he said hey come on up to Goshen I can give you a couple of days in my studio, show you how I make my work, what I'm doing, what I'm thinking about. He was so charitable and generous. And I, I, I rode up to Goshen, Indiana, um, got to see his work, worked with him, came back. And um, there's Mark on the left, an image that I took from when we were firing his wood kiln. And on the right, when I came back, uh, got connected uh, through Chase Gamblin at, at IU um, Indiana University for grad school uh, to uh, the Bloomington Clay Studio where I met a guy named Daniel Evans. Um, Mark's work as I showed you there, it's very clean, it's symmetrical, it's elegant, it's fine, um, and it's, it's light. I know you can't get the weight of it through an image, but it's light. And, and then Daniel's work, uh, more like this, it's a, a fairly simple little mug. And then it has this moment where it just explodes out. And I think that was probably the, the best way to describe Daniel was he was a, he was a guy that wasn't afraid to make things that were full of energy and in ways incapable of holding all that energy in. And uh, <laughs> when I saw his work and I saw the way that he went about things, um, I got to work with him as he had just built a little mini gamma, which was, I don't know what the square footage of it was, but it was very small and it would fire in, uh, I wanna say about 30 hours on wood alone. And we would fire it and we'd have a great time and we'd have great conversations. And I admired the way that he went about things. And I wanted to be like him in this rough handling of material that he would do. And I think his first starting point was like, well, I got some chicken grit. You can use that, which is, it's just chicken feed. Um, it's mostly made up of feldspar. You feed it to regular farm chickens. Uh, they eat it and it helps them digest their food. And you can put that in your clay and because it's feldspar, it's a ceramic material, it, it works. Um, and it was rough and I, I knew that I was throwing very tight at the time. If you could tell through those teapots, some of them, the bodies were thrown and I wanted to loosen. And by putting this chicken grit, um, I progressively bought sharper and sharper grit to the point where um, I couldn't touch it or I couldn't exert a lot of pressure because it would actually cut my hands and my fingers. And so if I didn't want to get cut, I'd have to relax. I'd have to give away some of my agency as a, as a thrower on the wheel. And I was thinking about pieces that were very firm it was going into my second year of grad school. And so I was making these very large pieces. They were on the wheel. Um, they had these huge bases. And it was during that time I was getting really excited. I, for the first time since Sinclair, I lived in the same city um, that I had for an entire year. And it let me settle in. I had friends. I had a church that I was going to and attending and loving. I had work that I was doing. I had an idea. Everything was great. And for some reason, I, I wanted to get away from the cyclical. The wheel comes around and it, it just keeps going. And I said, I, I want to break that up. And so I started putting these flat slabs on the sides of them and turning them upside down or facing them against the wall so that you could get the, the flashing pattern of the wood kiln 
to, to run by it. And it, um, with all the things that I had going well in my personal life, as well as teaching, which kicked in for my second of three years of grad school, which was a huge blessing, um, I slowly found myself unable to eat. Then I found myself unable to sleep. And then I found myself losing my ability to make my joy for creating, which I'd been depressed before, but I'd always been able to go to the studio and work through it. But I'd hit a point where I couldn't do that anymore. And so I fell into a deep depression. Um, eventually was diagnosed, uh, which was, it was rough. It meant that I had to evaluate whether or not I could continue to be a grad student at IU. And I had conversations, um, very sober conversations with my faculty about what it meant to, to step away. What would I have to do? What would that look like? How could I be reinstated, if ever? Um, and it was very difficult. And it was at that time that I, I just so happened to have a slot to take a class outside of ceramics. And so I took, um, I took textiles, figured I'd always done things that were permanent and hard. So let's do something that's not. And so I learned how to uh, screen print. So uh, screen printed out and then layered some more from some patterns that I'd made. And then we would tear the piece of cotton into strips and then reassemble it and make a quilt. And this was based off of my years of working retail. Um, the idea of graphs and always being told where we are in a graph, but it always changing and therefore having zero reference. Um, so it ended up meaning nothing. Um, but that was a concept of, of making something, tearing it, and then putting it together in a different way that suddenly it, it was something that just said, I have to take this with me to ceramics. And so I did, I started, um, I got away from the wheel completely because I wanted those textures, I wanted something rough. I wanted the excitement of making to come through without the smooth movement of a machine behind me. And so I started making these pieces that were out of slabs and I realized that I, I could wood fire them and I was excited and I realized, hey, well, what if I, what if I did the quilting, but in clay? And so I would take pieces of clay, I'd make slabs, I'd rip the slabs into pieces, then I would slam them back together, dome them or form them to a shape, let them stiffen up and then use those to create the bodies of my works. And so I ended up coming up with pieces like this. Um, still a jar, still has a lid that can be open and closed at the top. And um, other ones like this was wood firing, was excited about them. And at this time, um, still depressed, but I'd, I'd met this girl. And she was changing my life, blowing me away. And um, we decided that we were gonna get married and instead of bringing a tremendous amount of joy and support, uh, we ended up actually getting ostracized. Um, family relationships went downhill. Um, a relationship with our church was broken. Um, so in the midst of being clinically depressed, madly in love and everything else, I suddenly had to figure out what I was doing. And so there was more change and things got deeper and harder and rougher. And I made pieces where I said, forget the vessel. We're just gonna make a sculpture. And so I made a piece like this, fear no man, not even a holy man, um, as well as when all goes wrong, which was somewhat dramatic, but my life at the time was a mess. And I started to work through those things as we start to get to the other side of it. Um, I ended up proposing. We ended up getting married. Um, 
was it last uh, two months ago, we celebrated three years. We're still together. It's great. Um, but at that time, it was rough. And we really kind of had each other to lean on. And so I started to think about the relationship. And I was introduced to Martin Buber and his philosophy of the I thou. And so I started thinking about how people are complex, but we present ourselves as being simplistic so that we can be useful to one another. And so I started to bring in a narrative to my pieces and realized that I could not continue to wood kiln. So I decided to, hey, let's go back to that idea of silhouettes and black, but let's keep the clay quilting going. And so I started to make some pieces thinking about that depth on the bottom, simplicity on the top, and depth on the bottom, simplicity on top. And at that time, I'd, I'd been lobbying for the last three years to get that man, Bede Clark, to come and be a lecturer, presenter, visiting artist at IU, and it finally happened. And he came to my studio for a visit. Um, it was, God, I, mean, a, I wanna say a month before thesis, and he, looked at my work and he said, Wes, this is great. Um, I'm not expecting you to change. I realize that you have a very, very well thought out defense, I'm sure. Um, but just let the work be. Just let it go. Maybe not focus on this narrative so much. And uh, just to show you that uh, good things don't change. Um, this is a picture of us in 2017. Um, if you recognize it, um, he is wearing the exact same t-shirt that he was wearing in Houston in 2013 in 2017 when visiting my studio. Um, so if that's not a sign that like good people don't change, um, I don't know what is. Um, it was great. His advice was exactly what I needed. And so the process of clay quilting was um, starting with a series of slabs, throwing them onto a piece of canvas to make one large piece and then like I said, doming it to a form, letting it stiffen up and then erecting it so that I could then build off of it as a body. And so this is one where the piece is laid on its side and the other one is being built out of it. And as I was building, uh, this is the piece immediately after Bede's visit and I was working on it and working on it and I got it up and I was really excited and I got the front and then I was like, oh, I gotta fill the rest of the front. and. I capped it off and I realized, oh my goodness, I don't have room to put that tabletop above it. Um, I guess I'll just have to fire it like this. And so I put it in a kiln that had about an inch, maybe two inches of clearance uh, for a four and a half tall piece. And I got it out and that was it. That was all I needed. It was perfect. And I said, that's it, okay, this is where we're going forward. And so I made that piece and it started as what, what eventually became known as the, the monument series. It was a monument to the struggles and all of the um, obstacles and pain that I had to go through. And eventually I was able to make these works that were all of this dynamism and excitement and things happening that then became a marker of that, became a marker of all the energy and the activity that went into the making of it. And that's what the work was about. Um, and I was really excited. It was my thesis show. I got into it. I, I applied um, to some residencies afterwards, as Regina mentioned. Uh, I got into Baltimore Clerics, where I moved for a, a year with the wife, and um, it was it was pretty great. Uh, in this image, it's me and some of the other residents. Uh, it's Hannah Pierce on the left, then myself, Jeremy Wallace, and then Courtney Stone. Um, and in the back, you've got uh, also wearing a Baltimore Clerics is Mary Clunan. Um, love you, Mary, and Matt Heilick. And so I, I moved uh, to the big city, realized that I needed to make, I needed to find a way to scale my work down, but I wanted to keep all that dynamism, energy, um, roughness. And so I thought, well, what, what do I know? I was like, well, I know pots. 
but I'm also making sculpture. When I'm making pots. Well, what kind of pot goes in the center? What kind of pot takes your attention? What kind of pot goes in the middle of a table and takes it up? And I was like, a bowl. I was like, well, what if I put my piece or a bowl into that? And so that's exactly what I did. Oh yeah, saw some minor success first at the clay games. <laughs> Forgot to put that image in there. Um, so I flipped the bowl and I built into it almost like a manger and flipped it upside down. It was like, we're going somewhere. And so got that one fired and continued to work on that series, making bowls. And that's something that I'm continuing to work into today. Um, the big four, the big thing that I'm working on now is uh, how do I bring that dynamism and, and merge it with something recognizable like a pot. Um, that's something that I've been working on for the last uh, year or so since, uh, since Baltimore. Uh, it's something that I was working on particularly hard at my um, short term residency at the uh, Companion Gallery. Um, and so in the last few weeks, something that I've actually been working on that no one's seen the images of, so you are the first is I've been trying to think of a way to bring that into cups. And so this is a, a run of cups that I have. I kind of started on the idea of it and working through it with the uh, companion gallery, which when that show goes up, you'll see those, but these are the ones I'm currently working on. Oh, yeah, there's the East, East Mitchell uh, clay, which is adjacent to the uh, companion gallery. Uh, so I start with a heavily textured slab um, and then dome several of those to make some half cylinders, uh, throw some tops for the lips, start to put those together to make the bodies. I then cut those down in various ways, um, try and figure out to keep a stable opening. I take the thrown segments, match those with the bottom, and then slowly start to patch them all together to make them into mugs. and. I've been trying to figure out how exactly to do handles. I think I've gotten a way that works and now it's just figuring out, okay, well, how do I finish these? What kind of finishes is correct for these since I've had to change a little bit of my clay body since, uh, since my time at Baltimore. Um, but I'm working on it. It's, it's something where I, I didn't know that I would be bouncing between sculpture and pot so much. And I, I definitely didn't, if you had told me five years ago this is where I'd be, I, I wouldn't believe you. I wouldn't realize that through struggling so much, I would grow <laughs> as much as I have. And I didn't realize that my work could take such dramatic turns. Um, but that's been the way that my life has gone. And my work reflects my life. So at the moment, I'm still working through a lot of things and I imagine I'll be working through things till the day it's done. Um, and I haven't even completed these mugs yet. Um, but that's the work that I've been doing. And I have no regrets. If I had to do it all again, I'd, I'd do it all again. It's been worth it. It's been a rough ride. Um, there's been no shortage of angry nights, sad nights of the deepest sorrow, but days of incredible joy as well. And I like to bring that into my work. Um, so I'd like to say thank you so much for listening to my talk. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight, Wesley. Thank you so much for your time and for your honesty and for sharing with us. It was really, really wonderful. And uh, we look forward to seeing your journey as it unfolds in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much.